Greetings. I'm in the kitchen today, I'm going to share something with you that I think is fun. You might think it's fun, I'm not sure. Um, you might remember a while back that I shared with you, um, I think we were talking about cauldrons, and, um, and I was showing you my cast iron, some of my cast iron that I have, that I use all the time, that I've been using Oh, for 20 years at least. Well, more than 20 years. Some of it I've been using for almost 50 years, my whole marriage. But um, I've been cooking on fire for at least 20 years. Um, and we have a whole lot of ways of cooking with fire. And I thought, thought it might be fun to share some of those ways with you. And particularly at this time of the year because... Um, there's a lot of people that are in situations where they are perhaps um, without power. Like I'm, I'm recalling last winter in Texas, particularly in some other, some other areas where they were without power for such a long period of time that um, people were really having difficulties. They were diffi having difficulties, of course, keeping warm, but also having difficulties like trying to prepare food, for, warm food for the families. And I'm here to tell you that if you have a fireplace a fireplace, a wood burning fireplace, you can do anything that you could do in your kitchen, you could do in your fireplace. If you can cook on a stove, on top of a stove, or you can cook in a bake in an oven, you can cook in a fireplace, okay? And that's what I want to talk to you about today, cooking in a fireplace. I'm going to actually prepare a meal my husband and I are going to do. We love, we love our fireplace, we love cooking with fire. Um, and I really particularly love looking, working with my Dutch ovens. And I'm going to show you what I mean when I'm talking about a Dutch oven. Um, I know a lot of people have a lot of ideas of what a Dutch oven is, and I think it's sort of a generic term that people are using that term to mean a lot of things. But technically, a Dutch oven is a certain, it has certain characteristics that enable it to be used for baking particularly. It becomes a, an oven when used with fire, combination of fire, it operates the same way as your oven in your kitchen operates. You can actually adjust the temperature with your with fire and your Dutch oven to get pretty much an accurate, if you want a 400 or a 425 degree oven, you can have one or a 325 oven. You can pretty much have one. And that's the way traditionally foods were made, ovens were used in history they, if you think about the old fashioned, you see a lot of people now building ovens for wood, for wood fired pizza, etc. Those ovens that were used all the time, um, communal ovens, they were communal ovens for groups of people, not necessarily for individual people, but sometimes for the most wealthy, they had those kind of ovens. But the idea was that when the fire was at its hottest, you cooked, your, you did things like first you baked your bread, and then as it started to, your coals, your uh, coal started to cool, you know, die down a little bit. It wasn't quite so hot. Then you would do other things. You would, you know, you would um, things that didn't require such hot oven. And we're going to be doing that today a little bit. We're going to start out with one thing in a really hot fire, and then we're going to um, to reduce when the temperatures reduce, when the coals reduce. We're going to cook something a little slower a little bit later. But I'm going to tell you, you can cook about anything, and you can cook breakfast. <laughs> Um, there's a there's a farmer that I watch from time to time for some of his farming techniques. I'm not he's not exactly my. I don't think we would sit down and enjoy dinner together because, I think philosophically we're kind of at opposite ends. <laughs> of a lot of a lot of uh, spectrums. We're like a lot of opposite in a lot of ways. But he has some very good techniques and he's very knowledgeable about. Um, a lot of what he does know, some things he does know, and one thing he knows is how to cook using fire and fire his fireplace. And so I'm going to link that below. And if you give that video a watch, um, it would probably, you'd probably appreciate it. It's very relaxing to watch him cook breakfast for himself and his wife. Um, but I want to tell you that um, anything you can cook, you can use. He's, he's not baking in his, he's using skillet a skeleton his and uh, and maybe like some kind of a, a uh, well you'll have to watch it ouch <laughs> sorry twitch it is trying to crawl up my leg anyway um 
One thing that I made, made today, I made today, I'm going to enjoy. <laughs> For my breakfast, I have a, a cinnamon roll. And I'm going to tell you, you can make it in an oven, you can make it in a, in a duck, you can make it in the fireplace. Bake just the same. You wouldn't be able to tell if this was cooked in an oven or cooked in, a, in the fireplace. Mm. It's delicious. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> These are really good. <laughs> really good. Really delicious. And the technique that I use here, I'm not going to show you how I make these. Now, I'll have the recipe when my book, I'll probably include that in my book, but I'm going to tell you that um, the technique that I use for these is the same technique that I use when I do the bread. Making the dough, mix it up the dough one day and letting it rise overnight very slowly and then shaping it the next day and so it's ready for baking. When my fire is ready, it's ready to win. Okay. Mm, how rude. I've been waiting a long time to eat these. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Um, uh, one, one caveat before we start, I'm going to mention it. You're going to hear me say it again. Cooking in your fireplace is for wood cooking only. Cooking on with wood only. Never charcoal briquettes. And I'm going to be that again later, but never, really never, charcoal briquettes. Charcoal briquettes used inside the house are toxic. You will die. They were, they are deadly. They, they emit carbon monoxide, and it is deadly inside, even in a fireplace. But you don't have to use charcoal briquettes. You can make your own charcoal using, <laughs> using wood in your fireplace. It's very easy to do. And there's a lot of people um, that do it. There's another, I'll have to link to the channel. I forget his name. Um, but he cooks on cast iron all the time. He cooks out of doors on cast iron all the time, not in the fireplace. I don't think he's ever done it inside, he might. But but he can teach you everything you need to know about cooking with cast iron. But um, it's done a lot. And you're going to see some other videos here on YouTube where people do it. I just want to say, no matter what people tell you, please do not ever use charcoal on the inside your fireplace. Okay, but other than that, it's really a fun, it's a little fun hobby. It's really fun to do at this time of the year when we're kind of tucked in out of the cold and um, have the fire going anyway for warm sometimes. You might as well um, put a, make a bowl of soup, heat up a bowl of soup, heat up your dinner and with, use the fire as simply as that. Or put a hot dog on a fork and have a, have a cookout. Have a cookout in your, in your living room. Your kids would think that's fun. Okay, thank you so much. And stay tuned, and I'm going to I'm going to show you um, how I made how my husband and I made are going to make supper. Okay, I've had my dough rising overnight, like I do a lot of breads, a lot of overnight breads. Um, just in this Tupperware here, um, and I'm going to I'm going to get it shaped and ready for its second rise before it goes for baking. But I wanted to show you first before I do that. My setup for baking in a Dutch oven. I use a I use a system of aluminum pie pans, <laughs> not aluminum. These oh, actually these are disposable pie pans. Kind of heavy duty. They're not the thin kind. There's this one came from um, uh, Polly's famous pies. Polly's pies. Um, you can buy a lot of times if there's a pie recipe like Knott's Berry Farm or this is Polly's Pies or anything like that near you that serves a lot of pies. Marie Calendars, if that's even still in business. I'm not sure. But a lot of times they will sell you, if you don't buy pies from them, they will sell you these pans, which are really handy for, um, I use them for a lot of things when we're camping. But uh, what I want to show you is the system that I use in the um, Dutch oven when we're camping. Because I have to preheat my oven, get my oven really hot before I put the bread in, I'm going to um, use, and I also don't want the bread to be sitting on the bottom of my Dutch oven. Sometimes if you put, try to bake things on the very bottom in your Dutch oven without putting it on something, a rack or something, it will burn. It gets too hot underneath. So what I do is I use an old, an old pan 
The one that I normally use is absolutely black and sooty. I can't even, <laughs> can't even bring it in the house at this point. But I use one of these and I flip it over. And I'll show you when I go to put it in the oven. I just flip it over this way in the bottom of the oven. And then I use a second one, which I will, I will oil this pan and allow my dough to rise in here. And then when I go to put it in the hot oven, this will be in the, in the oven as it's heating. I will just plop that down in. My bread, I don't have to transfer my dough. I don't have to touch my dough and um, bake it that way. And then when I go to take out the bread, I will lift this up. This will stay in the oven. <laughs> if that makes sense. I think it makes sense. Okay, so the first thing I have to do is I just want to get this prepared first. I'm just going to oil this. Set this aside. Uh, I put a lot of oil in there. I didn't need quite that much. Um, these pans I use over and over and over and over and over again for so many things. I get more use out of this than anybody ever got out of using it for pie. I don't even use these for pie, actually. This is just olive oil, by the way. Olive oil is pretty much a staple in my house. Some people think olive oil is much too hot to use for this kind of a baking, but I don't find it too hot at all. It's fine. Okay, so I'm ready to turn my dough out. And my dough is very bubbly. You see the bubbles? It's been rising since yesterday. Um, and it's, it's a wet dough. This is an overnight dough, so it's a little bit wet. So I just want to get enough flour on my board here to, um, and in my hands, so my dough does not stick. Let me get something here. I'm just going to actually push the dough out. If I touch too much, it's going to be a mess. So I'm just pushing this down as much as I can. Pushing it out, pushing it out. Letting gravity work for me. Freeing it from the sides of the bowl. And the thing about this dough is it works really well, but see, it has no form. So I'm going to use a bench scraper and I end the flour. And I'm going to just flip it over a few times in that flour really quickly. Try to make it some kind of a ball. It's almost like a folding action into a ball, which I'm going to flip over. And take my prepared pan and plop it in. And that's it. <laughs> You're looking at my normal, rather normal, fireplace setup. Um, you can see my screen in front here. Um, but to cook in the fireplace, we don't use the screen, so we're going to take the screen away. So um, I could ask my, my handy helper to do that, move that away. And as you can see, you might notice, the very first thing you might notice is the absence of a grate in my in my fireplace because we removed the grate. The grate is what the logs sit on when normally when you burn a fire because we're not going to be using it today. But you can cook on a grate and I'm going to link a video um, below, I'll give the link below, to a, show someone actually cooking on a fireplace grate, how he adapted the grate to... Um, actually use a skillet for cooking. I think he put a skillet on there, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and um, it worked out really well. He yeah. got really cooked the whole breakfast on there. It was beautiful. So, um, but today we're not gonna be using that. I wanted to show you a few alternatives that you could use if you don't wanna use the grate. And one is something that we use, which is sort of tucked in. We have it tucked in right now. Joe, if you would swing that out so we could see it, show them how this works. This is an arm that is meant to hold um, some kind of a kettle. And here we have a cast iron kettle. Some of you might say it's a cauldron. It has a lid and you see it hangs. It simply hangs. 
and you can um, have it close. You can have it right above the fire. You can have it coming out. You can have it move it, swing it clear out. It, it comes clear out right here to keep it out of the way for a while. Now, if you want to take that kettle off of them so we can see, you can notice right away um, that there is there are no legs. It sits flat just like a skillet, which you want to show them a skillet, make sure we're talking about the same thing. As we can see, the backwards of a skillet, everybody's familiar with this, a cast iron skillet. Um, there's no feet on it. These are perfect to use in the fireplace, but you have to have something to set it on. We wouldn't set this directly down into the coals um, necessarily because the idea of using a cast iron um, pot of any kind is you want to have even heat. You want to have heat from around the sides, or you want to have heat from top and bottom to bake in them. You need both um, heat on the top and on the bottom. So this is not something good. If you put something this down on a fire or on coals, it would smother the coals and the coals would go out because your fire needs oxygen to burn. Okay, so we'll go a little bit more about it then later. Um, but right now, I want to show you a couple alternatives you have. If you don't want to cook on the grate, like Danny did in his video, um, um, we have some alternatives. You can use something like, which is commonly used, I believe, something like a fireplace, I mean not a fireplace, a barbecue, barbecue grill, top. grill top. You can see we don't use a barbecue grill top very often because I don't even know what it's called. But they're just a metal grate that um, is on like a Weber grill or something like that, that you, you're familiar with that, that you cook directly on. And those, you can take those off and you can let them, put them at the height you wanted and using like stacking up bricks or whatever to get the height you want to do. Okay, we have an alternative to that, something that we bought. So if you want to move, if you want to put that, that swing that arm back inside, out of the way, um, and show them what we have here. We bought this on a whim one time to take to a cooking event. We were going to need a lot of services. And this is a portable, I guess you just call it a portable grill. Meant for fire. As you can see, it's raised. Um, these, these legs it is on, they go up and down different heights. You can get it up to pretty much close to the top which you would never use up there but you could put that over a fire and use that if you raise it clear up there it would act like a keep to keep things warm while you were cooking more things underneath it that's what it's best used for um it is meant to have a fire underneath it build a fire underneath it and um then you put your which put the pot on top of where the put the pot up there so they can see or a skillet or something i guess the pot will work see i could set this directly on there and it would, this would be pushed back. It actually fits in our fireplace, and it would be pushed back in, and we could cook in there. That's really handy. Okay, so that's really good to use. These are fun to use. Um, I want to give you a little bit of caution that this was used normally with, um, there's a rotisserie bar that goes across where you can actually put meat on a rotisserie, which is meant to be able to be turned and hung over the fire to cook. But I want to caution you against using that because you never want to hang me directly over the flame or you can get a grease fire it can be really bad you don't want to do that if you want to do that you would want to put a pan um so wherever your meat is strong whatever side your meat is directly under it should be a pan to catch the dripping so they don't fall down into the fire and that's done very easily we'll show you some of those techniques maybe if you're interested later on we'll do some cooking outside so we can really do some different setups for you um, but this is mainly just meant for those of you who are tucked inside who might need have a situation where you need to cook in your fireplace and you have that option. Okay, so this is not what we're going to be using today, however. We're going to be using regular today what most people that are campers at least call a Dutch oven, a real Dutch oven. While this is a cast iron and it is called a Dutch oven, people tend to, it's like tissues or ketchup or whatever you know people take a brand or a type of something and they apply it to everything I don't know if that's the same thing but but uh, a Dutch oven is not normally considered to be this you want to take these things away and we'll get a what we're going to be using today for our cooking is a cast iron just like this one kettle that I have but the difference there's two major differences here you can see um, first of all did you want to pick it up underneath you see three legs there's three legs and there's a reason for that because that is meant to design to have fire underneath 
it. It will actually sit in the coals and you'll see that later when we go to light it. The other difference is the top is the lid. I don't know if you can tell from the picture. I hope you can. There's an in, it's indented. Um, there's a, it has a lip that is raised around the outside of the, of the, of the lid. And so that is meant to put coals on top of the lid as well. So you cook by using these by putting coals on top and coals underneath and around wherever it should be all around. And that is going to have this work as an actual oven. It will, it will operate just like an oven. And there are some people who take this very seriously who have, um, who use, there are charts you can get online. If you're going to use charcoal briquettes, um, you, there's actually a formula that you know how many charcoal briquettes go on top of and how many go underneath for whatever temperature oven you're trying to get to. And it is pretty accurate. We've done that. But I have to say, I'm going to say this with the greatest, greatest emphasis. We never, ever, 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 ever use charcoal briquettes inside a house. Not in a fireplace, not in a wood stove, nowhere. Not beside a window because it is toxic, you will die. It is carbon monoxide. It is for outdoor cooking only, absolutely only. We're going to be using wood today. You see wood, there's wood. <laughs> we're gonna use wood. And sometimes when we're cooking, we don't ever, you know, Joe and I don't ever even use charcoal briquettes anymore when we cook. We cook, when we do anything like that, we use a wood, hardwood charcoal lump charcoal, which is made of only 100% wood. There's no additive to it. But we're not going to use that in the house either. We're going to use wood. We're going to make our own charcoal, so to speak, the old-fashioned way. <laughs> and if you want to move this oven out of the, just the side, well, maybe you can see behind it. We can almost see behind it. They're laying in the fireplace behind on the floor of the fireplace. It's pretty much charcoal laying there, right? Um, you don't have a tong. Do you have a tong? We could pick up a piece of that. This is from a fire we had probably yesterday uh -huh. or the day before. And it just was left over from the charcoal. And that is actually charcoal. Charcoal. That is hardwood charcoal. And, and that's what we And I made that. <laughs> yes, and Joe made that. That was his. He very made it himself. And he didn't even dry. He just made a fire and that was what was left. <laughs> so we're going to be using that. Okay. And we're going to be using the Dutch oven that he just showed you. And we're going to be doing, we're going to be baking some bread in that one. And then I have another one. Do you want to get that other one down just to show them right in front of you there? We're going to also be making our main dish for the evening. This one, this needs cleaned off. It has cobwebs all over it. It was outside. But this one is, is really the same, except there's one, one significant difference. Do you want to take the lid off and show them? There are also feet. I don't know if you can see. I don't think they can see it at this angle. On the, there you go, on the lid as well. That because this is also doubles as a skillet that you could turn that over and use that as a skillet on the coals yourself. And um, we've got a really good bed of coals here and a pretty good fire. The oven has been preheated. Um, you're going to take that lid off. Look at this neat little lid lifter handle thing he's got. He's going he's gonna to put that pan. He's going to drop the bread in. And just take that razor blade and just give it a couple slashes across the top if you would. Just not, yeah. Okay. And um, get the lid on it. We're going to get, first of all, he's going to put the, he's going to put the, put the lid on. This is really hot. It's been sitting here a long time. He has moved some coals out. Um, in the front here, closer to the front, so we can get some coals underneath it, leaving the fire burning behind, and then he's going to put some coals on the top. He's got some tongs or a shovel here. He's going to just shovel some. Do you want to tell the percentage, what percentage of you have, like on the top and the bottom? Uh, well, it, <laughs> it's a little more, it's a more... It's mostly on the bottom. You should have it mostly on the top. Well, it'll be mostly on the top, yes, when I get this. Yeah. When they get it all on there, you get more heat coming down on it than you get from underneath. And as you can see, the one drawback to this system <laughs> is that um, in order to know when, in order to know when the bread is done, um, you're going to have to pick up this lid. Don't put too many on the yeah, top. That's enough. Right there. That's it. 
in order to know when this bread is done, we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to peek it and we peek at it. And that's why we shove them a lid lifter here. This is a neat little tool that we got. You got this, wherever you can buy Dutch ovens, you can buy this. It just fits under that handle. It lifts. And you can lift it. Okay. So we don't want to lift it until we have to. So we're just going to try to pay a lot of attention. He's going to keep coals going in the back. As we need them, he will add them or he will take it away if he thinks it's cooking too fast. Um, a good rule of thumb is you got to hold your hand over it. How many seconds can you keep your hand above the coals? <laughs> is a good indication of how hot the fire is. How hot your coals are. So, um, but also we're going to pay attention and we are, when we start to smell it, um, yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> that's a good key. Then we'll then we'll take a peek. So we're just he's gonna just keep the coals going for a little while here and we'll come back and we'll check on it later. It's been about 30 minutes on the bread, so we're going to and we're just starting to smell it a little bit. Of course it's a little hard to tell because I'm not that close to it. But we're gonna open this up and just take a peek and see what we have. So do you want to um pull it out? Or just take the lid, take the lid lifter and peek, take a peek. If you need to pull it out, pull it out. I don't want to get ashes on it. Okay. Joe's going to actually pull this out and put it up on the hearth so we don't, we don't want to dump ashes into the bread. So put the handle down and we'll see. He's going to have to lift this straight up so we get a good look and see what's inside. And, oh, looks oh, like bread to me. Oh, boy. Nice and steamy. Look at the steam coming out, and it's done. I'm pretty sure it's done. Do you want to lay the lid down? And he's going to he's gonna try to reach in and get that um, out. Lovely. Look at that. Look at that. Okay, I just pulled my oven out here. We decided to go ahead and use the same oven we have the bread in because it's already hot. We don't have to preheat it. And I'm just going to put a little bit of oil in the bottom of the uh, oven, just enough to kind of coat the bottom. And then I'm going to move it back. Where's the platform? Here, here. You do it. I'm going to move this back into the under the fire. Good. Under the coals. I'm going to make sure the oil's hot. And then the first thing I do, I'm going to have some sausages here. These are just turkey Italian sausages. We had some leftover ones and I'm going to just put them in. And I'm going to get them a little bit brown. I want to get these browned up so I can cut them into pieces. And I can hear it sizzling just a little bit. I'm just going to give it another second. Listening, I can hear the, I can hear the, the oil on the bottom. There we go. Now we got a sizzle. And I'm just going to get those browned up a little bit. And then I'm going to take them out and cut them up into smaller pieces. I can't cut it up this way because it's, it's not cooked. I'm not going to use the lid right now. The lid is still sitting here on the hearth. And of course you can see in the back we're making more coals. So I'm just going to let this go a little bit and try to get them brown on all of the sides. And then we're going to be, the rest of the recipe is just dumping stuff in. Dumping stuff in. And I'll show you that in a second. There we go. Now we got a nice, nice sizzle. We've been doing this so long that we don't even think about wearing gloves, but of course you should be using gloves. Well, longer tongues. I mean, and longer tongues. I want to point out though, this is something that we use. This was in our, these were in our, in our, um, our kit for our medieval camp. This is just wool, 100% wool, felted wool that is, um, it's actually full, that is layered. I have about four, la two layers of wool and another thin layer of wool in between it, 100% wool. No synthetics because synthetics in your fire will just melt. We don't want that. You don't ever want to have that. That's very dangerous. It has to be natural fibers. And these work really well. 
as does a towel, just a plain cotton towel or another piece of piece of uh, piece of wool. So anyway, I'm getting these nice and brown. Oh, that's good. Look at that. Give me a light in there. See, this works just like a skillet on the stove. You can see this is how Danny is able to cook a lovely breakfast. Let's get a little color on these. But they're not cooked. They're going to still be raw. I'm not going to attempt to make them into small pieces, just shorter pieces. Probably um, four pieces each, each link and then maybe four. Okay, I'm going to just, I'm ready. The rest, my recipe here is just pretty much a dump. I'm going to just put a little more oil in here just to make sure I have a nice coating of oil in the bottom. And it's not too hot because I don't want to burn my onions because I'm going to start, this is like a half of an onion, about a half of an onion thinly sliced. I'm just going to put those around a little bit. I don't want it to go too much. Um, then I have my main, main gravy in here. This is my sauerkraut from my garden. Um, what year did you say this was? 2018. 2018. Uh, this one should have been eaten. I can't believe it's left, but this is gold in a jar. I'm telling you. If you if you like sauerkraut, you've really never eaten sauerkraut till you've eaten homemade sauerkraut. It just doesn't happen. Okay. This is just a quart because it's just for my husband and me. But if anybody else walks in the door, we would have to have a lot more. Okay. Okay. Just breaking that up a little bit. Now I'm adding about a cup or so of white wine. I don't drink white wine, but I chose to cook with it. And that's just this right now, I believe. Usually what I use. Something like that. Okay. Um, I have a, this is one, one clove of, is that one clove of garlic? Two cloves of garlic. Just chopped small. That goes in. Okay. Um, I need a bay leaf. Nice bay leaf goes in. I'm not sure what bay leaf is, but we put it in everything, don't we? I have some juniper berries. Oh. This is this is an unusual um, ingredient. It's uh, this is what they make gin out of, I think. I'm not making gin. Trying to follow a recipe. I don't usually use a recipe, but I just a handful. I say four or five, so I'm just that's like six or something. I'm just putting those in. There's just a nice flavor. I don't know what it does, but it's a nice flavor. Okay. I have fresh thyme, but I'm gonna just use a handful of oh this is caraway. I never got the time. Oh yes, I did. I never got the time out. So I'm gonna put a handful of caraway seeds. Caraway and sauerkraut just are like a perfect marriage. That goes in. Um, I would usually use fresh thyme, and I do have fresh thyme, but I forgot to pick it, so I'm going to use just ground thyme, and that's what most of you would have if you would do something like this, probably. So just about a half a teaspoon or something like that. Like I said, I don't measure. I normally don't measure. Something that is very important, though, that goes in. I have two Granny Smith apples, and I have just peeled them, and I am just coarsely, very coarsely, very crudely chopping them and going to go in. These are perfect with both with pork and with um, the sauerkraut. It just adds a beautiful sweetness. Now, a lot of people, but it's not too sweet. You know, it's not too sweet. You wouldn't want something too sweet with sauerkraut. That would be that would be bad but these are just lovely 
they, they kind of take on the flavor of the sauerkraut. They keep everything nice and juicy. Um, like I said, I'm not real careful about the dice because most of them are going to just fall apart in the, in the cook anyway. But a Granny Smith is a tart apple. I wouldn't put anything too sweet in here. And a Granny Smith is more likely to keep most of its shape when it's cooked. So, Now, a lot of people, when they do sauerkraut this way, will add potatoes. And you could do that. Just chop up potatoes instead of maybe the apple. Do potatoes this way. Um, I don't, am not in that habit for a couple reasons. Number one, I did this recipe all the time when I was camping with my historical hobbyists group and potatoes were not period to us in <laughs> during the middle ages it was not period potatoes was a new world food that we didn't get till much later so and then I have look at I have these beautiful cores and beautiful peels and it's going to go in my combos but if you've watched my channel in the past this is perfect um perfect candidate for apple cider vinegar which I might do, but I don't need any, so it's just gonna go. It's just gonna go. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut up my sausages and add my sausages to the mix. As I'm, I could probably do it right here. I have time. Okay, before I get, before I add my sausages, I want to mix this up a little bit. Okay, I've quartered the, we've quartered the sausages, and as you see, they're not cooked at all. They're raw inside, but they have a nice browning brown on the outside. And we're just gonna put these in. Is that somebody coming along to help us cook? Yeah. And I'm going to stir that up first before I add my last ingredient. So you see, this, even though the sauerkraut could be eaten the way it is, the apple could be eaten the way it is, the sausage is far from cooked. It's still raw. And I have one last ingredient I'm going to add that I put out of the freezer. And these are thinly sliced pork chops, <laughs> which I call worthless pork. It's worthless pork. To me, it's worthless pork. We keep buying it because they put these thin pork chops on sale all the time. And I have yet to learn how to cook them. Can I have a little bit of pepper? I forgot the pepper. I could put a little salt too. I've yet to cook these without um, drying them out. But they're really good for something like this, where I want the pork flavor and a little bit of the pork meat, but I don't want it to be dry. And I put them on top. Let me get some pepper here. You notice I left them on the bone, what there is of the bone. I did that on purpose because they're not going to stay, that bone I got to pull out of there, but there's a little bit of flavor. Whatever flavor is in the pork is in that little bit of fat and in the, <laughs> and in the bone. So I have it on top and after it cooks, I'm going to be able to pull that bone out of there and then I'm going to be able to break apart this meat and work it out and, and mix it up into the, um, into my dish. So we're ready to put this back on the fire. So. Um, I'm going to switch places with Joe, I think. Let him in here. We'll keep the camera running so he can move it back on the fire. Okay, he's going to put the lid back on carefully in case he doesn't want to put any of the ash from the coals in my dish. <laughs> that would not be delicious. And he's going to move that back into the coals. And this is going to go slower. This does not have to be such a hot fire, which is another reason we want to do this separately. We do this afterwards, the bread. But he wants to keep it around a constant temperature, maybe around 350 rather than 400 or 425 or whatever the bread went at. 
He's just going to shove a little bit more coals on the top. But now this is not baking, so he wants pretty much an even distribution of coals top and bottom to get them, to get it cooked. Okay. That looks like a lot, but some of those are spent. Okay, we're out of the oven, ready to serve. I have taken the pork chops, and just it pulled the bones out and it just fell apart. Okay. As you can see, we're really done. The pork has just fallen. I've taken the pork out and just um, just pulled it apart, <laughs> pulled the bones out. It's, it's all ready to, to plate up. So we're gonna plate this up and cut up our bread, get some apple butter, and we're ready to eat. Wave to everybody, Joe. Hi, everybody. <laughs> We're ready to sit down and eat, and here's our plates in front of us. I wanted to get a shot. I wasn't going to take a shot of this, but it looks so lovely. It looks so delicious, and I really want to show off the bread. Look how beautiful the bread is. And we've got our apple butter ready to go. And um, you can see in all the sausages and pork and sauerkraut, it's just, it looks delicious. It doesn't look delicious. Okay, you want to give us a, sure a slanch of... Want to give us a slancha? And thank everybody for coming. Slancha. <laughs> okay. Happy fires in your fireplace. <laughs> okay. Cook and eat. Bye. Cook and eat. Thanks for watching.